I'm a designer. I've been creating things my whole life. Um, my kids are here today, so they can tell you that, um, well, when I was younger, or as they would say, well before the turn of the last century, um, I was making things. And one of the things that I have of real fond memories of is the time that I spent with my Barbies. Now, I wasn't playing with Barbies, let me be clear, um, but my Barbies couldn't afford a dream house. And so I spent a lot of time creating spaces for them to live, which was, which was great. Um, I was lucky that we couldn't afford a dream house because I had to be creative and to make my own, make my own way. So I would take Kleenex boxes and flip them over and use them as, as queen size beds. I take match books or boxes that stack them up with sliding drawers, perfect functional dressers. Um, you know, spools of thread make great chairs. So anyway, I think you get the idea that I, I was forced to sort of look at what was around me, use what was there, and then make something of it. So I'm 47 now. I've been doing design, practicing design for 25 years. I'm a multidisciplinary designer. And that simply means I work in lots of different media. And for me, um, I started as a graphic designer. Um, I do some new media design, which is the internet and video. And um, for the past 15 years, I've been doing a lot of work in the built environment, which I enjoy very much. And that's things like temporary exhibitions, interiors, signage and environmental graphics. So when you've been doing something as long as I've been doing it, uh, hopefully, if you're thinking, you ask yourself, what is it um, that I want to be doing? What do, I, what do I find meaning in? And for me, um, that has been taking something that has a past and giving it a future. So what do I mean by that? The St. Louis Public Library. Um, St. Louis Public Library was designed over 100 years ago by Cass Gilbert in the Beaux-Arts style. If you're not familiar with Cass Gilbert, he's also the person who designed the um, Supreme Court building in Washington, D.C. and the St. Louis Art Museum here in Forest Park. This building is an incredible gem. It's a national treasure and we are so lucky to have it. Um, and we're also very lucky that a group of very, very smart people got together and decided that this is one building that deserves to have an even more vibrant future. Um, you know, it's not real popular these days to invest millions of dollars in libraries, um, but these people figured out how to do it. So they hired the very talented George Nikolaevich and his staff at um, Canon Design to oversee the restoration and the renovation of this important building. Fortunately for me, um, they, uh, Canon hired my firm to do the signage and environmental graphics for the project. So the first thing that we do when we start a project like this is we do what we call a visual audit. Um, so we went to the building and we spent a lot of time looking at the signs. And as you can see, um, though the building was worth saving, we would argue that the signage was not. <laughs> so we quickly uh, stopped looking at the signage and started looking past the signage at all the incredible ornament that lives in the space. There is ornament everywhere. It's on the ceilings, it's on the floors, it's on the walls, it is throughout. It's in wood, it's in metal, um, it's wall covering, everywhere you look. It's, it's really remarkable. And one thing that we realized, um, or an idea that we had was that the work that we were doing, the signage and graphics, had to live in both the new spaces and the old spaces. And so we felt like we needed something that would connect the two. And so we decided that we would take these four different pieces of ornament and simplify them. So in a, in a way, sort of make them contemporary versions of the old. And so we took that ornament and we then turned it into pattern. And then we used it throughout the project. And we think it was a nice way to bridge the old again with the new. And that this, because this, because this ornament had a foundation in something um, long ago that's in the space, it was a perfect partner to the renovated spaces and the restored spaces. So we use the ornament uh, on glass, on signs. It's used um, to screen rooms um, for privacy. Um, it's also used on the book stacks. Um, and as a wayfinding device, there's four floors to the library. So each floor has a different, a different um, icon. So um, hopefully it helps you to keep track of where you are. Another thing that we um, looked at when we looked at the building is there's a lot of 
typography on the outside of the building especially and a little bit on the inside, which makes perfect sense, right? It's a library. Um, so there's words, there's words everywhere beyond just the books. So we thought that would be another great way to connect the old and the new. So our sort of contemporary take on some of the things that Cass Gilbert was doing. And so when you walk up to the library on the new north entrance, there's a giant welcome, friendly, inviting. You want to, be feel, you want to feel welcome at the library. And so we added, um, we put the giant welcome in a very contemporary typeface, sans serif, lowercase, very friendly. And then um, as you back up from there and you look at the new north entrance, um, this beautiful fountain designed by George um, Nikolaevich, um, we added some things to the vertical panels. We added book titles. And then in the bed of the fountain, um, the library actually reached out to patrons and asked them, uh, asked them for inspired pieces of literature. And then the library curated those, gave them to us, and then we put them on the bed of the, fo the, bed of the fountain. When you walk in, you're greeted by a giant hello. Seems appropriate at an information desk. Um, in the teen library, there's, it's, a big, it's a big room with old bones, a great looking room. On one end, we put the word dream, and on the other end, we put the word be. And in the middle is a, is a simple glass wall, very contemporary, um, very contemporary. And we, our, our task was to, do, to decorate that wall, and so we just added a rainbow wall. Why not? Um, one of the remarkable things about the library is the incredible ornament that lives um, on the ceilings. And so we thought it would be great if we could do sort of a contemporary take on that ornament. And so we found two places to do that. Um, and this is the children's library. Kids like to roll around, look around, um, and so we thought we'd give them something to look at. So on the ceiling um, of, the of the children's library, we put what we call our white puffy cloud typeface. So we took the typeface we were using throughout, and then we converted it to be puffy clouds. And then the Center for the Reader is a, is a room that did not exist um, before Canon was put in charge. And so they took this space that was chopped up a bunch of offices and corridors, and they turned it into this beautiful, expansive room. And in the room, they added five recessed ovals to the ceiling. And we thought that would be another good place to add some typography. And so we took first lines of famous works of fiction and put them on the ceiling. So as you can imagine, as a designer, as a designer who loves typography and someone who loves working in the built environment, this was a dream project. And it was really great to be part of taking this building that um, had just this incredible past, but I think an even more promising future, thanks to the work of a lot of really dedicated, passionate people. Another project I want to speak with you about is um, 7400 Pershing. This is actually um, my studio. It's where my office is located now. Uh, I know you're looking at that photo and you're saying, and so this is the building we bought. This is what it looked like when we bought it. And wow, we were crazy. Um, <laughs> so most people would consider this a teardown. We didn't. We actually can't imagine, couldn't imagine the corner of Jackson and Pershing without it. And so we made a, probably a bad business decision and invested a whole bunch more money than we would have if we had rebuilt from scratch and decided to give this building, which had a past, an, a, a future. And while we were working on the project, I was actually in New York on business, and I get a text on my phone, and it's from our contractor, and he sends me this photo. So this guy, he was um, 80 years old, showed up at the job site with this photo. Um, I guess he took it off of his wall and put it in his car and came to see us. And uh, I was so sad I wasn't there. Um, and he said, oh, I just thought you might like to see this picture. It was the, it's, this is what the building looked like in 1920 when my father-in-law built it as a service station. So pretty cool. So can you imagine if we had torn the building down? This guy would just have been devastated, I think. <laughs> Unfortunately, our contractor did not get his name or number. So if you know this guy, have him call me. I'd like to meet him. Um, so what I like to say, we didn't buy a building, we bought a roof. It's a huge roof. And one of the most important things that we had to figure out was what we were going to do with it. So um, it was clad in asbestos shingles. Those aren't very nice for the community. So we had those removed safely. And we replaced it with a metal roof. Um, metal for a variety of reasons. Um, it's, well, this one is, happens to be a 100-year roof now. Um, it's, it's recyclable. Um, our particular metal is zinc. Um, and again, I'm a designer, so it also is gorgeous, if I say so. 
Um, on the back side of our roof, again, it's, uh, I don't know if I said this, but it's a north and south facing roof, so it's perfect for solar. So we added 26 solar panels across the back portion of the roof. And then on the west side of the building, we, um, we drilled for um, five wells for our geothermal HVAC system. And I will tell you that the combination of the solar and geothermal has been incredible. Um, our first bill was a $1.85 utility bill. Um, but we've been averaging about $12 a month, which is remarkable. Uh, the last thing that we did on the outside of the building um, was, so the building was surrounded by concrete. So, um, again, another brilliant business decision. Uh, so some friends of ours, the Sallies, they said to us, they said, um, what are you going to do about landscaping? Now, we're knee deep in, like, you know, roof issues. And so we said, we don't know. And they said, well, would you consider a rain garden? And um, we said, well, what's a rain garden? So we learned all about rain gardens and the ecology of rain gardens. So, but, but the bad business decision was probably when we cut out a 40-foot by 11-foot hole in the pavement that could have been parking, and we <laughs> put a garden in. Um, and it's planted with Missouri native plants. And the great thing about this garden is, so instead of the water that would have run off the roof and gone into the sewer system, it's now being filtered naturally through the earth as it should be, um, and we're taking a bit of a drain off of, off of MSD. On the inside, polished concrete floors. So rather than adding a new material, we took a material that already existed. There's architectural salvage doors, same principle. Um, we have energy efficient appliances, which are new, <laughs> needed new appliances. And then on the second floor, we have a big open um, studio plan. We worked with Cohen Architecture to make this building work for us and the way we work. Um, it, it, didn't, it didn't resemble that in any way before we started, but now it does. There's a big open studio on the second floor. Um, and then we have windows that open and close, and we added a second floor deck, because I think everybody deserves um, fresh air at work. One cool thing, another cool thing that happened is right after we bought the building, we were looking around in the attic, and we found these two identical neon signs, which was pretty amazing. Um, and it was even more amazing when we found out, when we took them to the restore, that they were approximately made in the between 1930 and 1940, which means they survived this long. So you know, far be it from us to throw them away. So we, of course, had them restored. And we have them hanging on opposite ends of the studio, and they, um, they make a really nice uh, bookends in the space. So what future did we give our building with such a great history? Well, we gave it a, a green future. We, we made it a sustainable workplace. The urban farm. So if you've been on um, Waterman Avenue between Kings Highway and Union, then you've been by the urban farm. Um, Chances are you didn't notice it, but fortunately for the Central West End and all of us, um, Arthur and Nancy Culbert did notice it. So they walk and drive by this piece of land all the time, and they recognize that there was nothing really productive happening with this, with this soil. And so they figured out who owned the property. They called him up, and they said, hey, you know, until you figure out what you're going to do with your former site of a burned down apartment building, um, could we put a farm on it? And apparently the guy thought about it, I think, overnight, and called him the next day and said, sure, and would you like a water line put in, which is amazing. Um, so that was the beginning of um, a bunch of partnerships with, which have spawned from this, from this Center West End farm. The next thing that they did after they talked to that guy is they went to an, um, two different food pantries in the Center West End, and they asked the clients of the food pantry what kinds of food they would want to eat. And that's what they planted. So they took about um, a third of this one acre lot and they planted, and they planted okra and collard greens and sweet potato, not sweet potatoes, um, corn and celery and all the, you know, 40, 40 different kinds or more of produce. And they worked with school kids from New City School and they worked with the alder person in the area to make sure that there were Jersey barriers to keep the alley safe. And there's all sorts of people, it's countless, countless partnerships. The food pantry actually even got designated best food pantry because of the organic produce. Um, who knew that there was best food pantry? But there is. <laughs> For my part, what, so what do I have to do with the urban farm? Well, I'm certainly not the originator, but um, my family, my son and my daughter and my husband, we get up every Saturday morning, except when it looks like it does outside today, and we work in the garden. And we plant, and we seed, or we weed, and we prune, 
and we harvest, and we pack the produce up so that it can be sent off to the food pantries. And we also have some fun while we're at it. Um, so this has been an incredible thing for us to show our kids, right? So there's this old piece of land that nothing was going on with, and um, the gift that the community gave to the rest of the community was to make it viable, and I think this is an important thing to teach our children. What do these three things have in common? The library, my office, and the farm. I think um, certainly not size or scope or budget, although when we were doing our remodel it felt like billions of dollars. Um, but they have a lot in common. All three are located about seven miles from each other right here in our community. All three have served an important um, role in the communities that they've, that they've been in. Uh, the library unquestionably has been so significant to our region. Um, the urban farm is changing people's lives who wouldn't have otherwise had good produce. And my silly little building, well, the neighborhood just looks a little more cuter than it did. <laughs> That's important. Uh, I'm a designer. Um, but I would say that the most important thing that they have in common is that all three places had people that believed in them. They, they recognized the contributions that they've made in history, and they understood that they have more to give and that they can have a bright, a bright future. I mean, I guess I've been doing this kind of thing all my life where I, I you know, sure, I design new stuff. I mean, that's part of what you do as a designer. But, but this idea of, you know, of taking, taking what's around you and working with it, you know, whether it's Kleenex boxes um, for beds or architectural ornament as part of a signage and wayfinding system or an old building and turning it into a modern workplace and even a vacant lot and turning it into a productive farm. So I would invite you to stop, you know, go out there and don't, don't always reach for the new, but, but give something that's old, um, give it a future. Thank you.